So we are going to dive in, and uh, as we head into a time of baptism, uh, I get to talk a little bit about this celebration. So in the next uh, two weekends, uh, so this weekend and next weekend at all four sites, we're going to be doing baptisms. And over the, the four sites, there are 55 people going through the waters of baptism, which is amazing. Uh, 34 of them, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> So 34 of them here at Downs Road, and you'll get to see uh, three of those here tonight in the service. Uh, But a big part of what you're going to hear this weekend is actually going to come through the witness and the testimonies that you will hear. And also, if you pick up the uh, the testimony booklet, you can read those at your leisure, not during the sermon. You can read that when you get home. But before we hear the testimonies and the witness uh, of the baptisms, I want to unpack what we believe the Bible has to say about baptism. Because if you would go out on the streets uh, here in Abbotsford or any city for that matter and ask a random stranger, what do you know about baptism? I I think most people probably in North America still have uh, enough of an understanding to know it has something to do with church, with religion. Uh, That's what they do, you know, inside some religious facility somewhere. Maybe they watched my Big Fat Greek wedding and they saw the guy get baptized so that he could get get married, etc. But they don't truly understand what baptism is all about. Uh, Sadly as well, inside the church, Uh, There are many people inside the church who don't fully understand the significance and the importance that undergirds water baptism. And so if you want to summarize baptism, you might put it this way, that what we witness in water baptism is this. It is a declaration of a new life in Christ. That's just about as simple as it gets. It's the declaration of my new life in Christ. And so water baptism gives testimony or gives witness to the transformation that has happened in the inner man. Uh, An individual has heard the call of God on their life. Uh, They have heard the gospel preached. They have responded. They have recognized their need to Christ. And they respond in faith to the call of God on their life. And then water baptism follows that profession of faith in going public with your faith, if you will. And so believer's baptism, which is what we practice as a church, is a graphic declaration regarding our identity in Christ. In essence, what we're saying is my life has changed. My life is different than what it used to be. I've been transformed by the work of God. I was walking away from God. I was a rebel. I was an antagonist. However you want to describe your life before coming to faith in Christ. But I have turned Repentance is the word. I have turned and changed my mind. I have given my life to somebody else. I'm no longer in charge. I've got a new identity. And I want the world to know that the old me, the me that you used to know, is dead and buried and gone. I've got a new Lord, a new master. It's not me anymore. It's Jesus Christ. Now, in the West, because of the peace and prosperity and the privilege that we have in the West, I think that many of us have taken baptism and the rites of baptism for granted. It's really no big deal. Uh, It's, yes, it's a religious ceremony. All Christian churches do it, so what's the big deal? But in Muslim nations, if you come to faith in Christ, persecution typically doesn't follow just your decision to follow Christ but persecution ramps up upon your public baptism. Uh, so I've shared this story before, but it's sailing to our talk this morning, Rick, uh, this morning, tonight too, as well. Uh, Nick and Ruth Ripken spent 30 years serving in access-restricted countries. So nations that don't welcome Christian witness, who don't want Christian missionaries coming in over 30 years of their life, and they have conducted hundreds of interviews with Christians in 60 closed nations. And in particular, their interviews with Christians who come out of Muslim backgrounds, they have found that with these individuals, persecution for their faith didn't happen before they were baptized. In fact, there would be an openness, in many cases, to be a seeker. It's okay to explore what other faiths have to say. So you can go to those Christian events. You can read the Christian Bible if you want. You can, you can even maybe talk about making a faith commitment, but it is the moment that you go public with baptism that persecution begins in these countries. And so Nick writes this a couple years ago, that Islam is convinced that it is at baptism its sons and daughters have become separated from their former way of life. Islam identifies baptism as the time when the believer has died to the old way and embraced a new 
worldview. Now, why I'm emphasizing this is because of the peace and prosperity and the take it for granted in the Western countries that we have, that it's no big deal. Like nobody is going to persecute anybody who is baptized this weekend is going to not walk out those doors and receive persecution. And so Ripken goes on to say this, perhaps Islam understands what the West has forgotten. Perhaps Islam understands the meaning of baptism more profoundly than the church does. Baptism represents dying to sin, dying to self, dying to an old way of living in community. In other words, on a most basic level, baptism signals a person's new identity. I belong to God and I belong to God's people. Jesus is my Lord and this is my family. And and so in a lot of ways, a baptism is like wearing the team jersey. It's putting on the Jesus jacket, if you will, and saying, I'm part of team Jesus. But baptism is far more than initiation rite. It is far more than some spiritual hoop that you have to jump through. It is far more than your entry into the membership of the church, which it is all those things historically in the life of the church. Baptism, you probably heard it said, is an outward sign of an inward reality. An outward sign of an inward reality. And it's that inward reality that I want to talk about for a few minutes before we witness some baptisms here tonight. Baptism is a tangible symbol of what happens in the life of the follower of Jesus. And it points to our salvation. It points to a past event. It points to a future promise. And it points to a present reality. These three things is what we're going to talk about. The purchase and the promise and the power of the resurrection in our life. And so if you needed just one verse of scripture to wrap up what we're going to be talking about, probably 2 Corinthians 5 could be the best wrap up for the the entire message is this. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And so baptism is all about that new life. And it goes to the macro story that left to ourselves, none of us would ever walk towards God. We're we're born with an inclination that would lead us away from God, not to seek God. We're born, however you want to describe it, as rebels, as enemies. Uh, While we're weak, Romans 5 says, while we're strangers, while we're aliens, God in his mercy calls us from death to life. And when we rightly understand that, it changes everything about the way we live our lives. Now, you will know this if you've read the New Testament over any length of time, that it is almost impossible to separate the three aspects of salvation, past tense, present tense, future. But our baptism represents all three, a threefold reality. It represents new life. We were purchased in Christ, past tense. It also represents new life promised in Christ, future tense. And it represents new life empowered by Christ in the present tense. And as I mentioned, it's nearly impossible to separate those three because as you get into the New Testament, you read any text to do with salvation and you will find almost always in every text a past, present, and a future context to our salvation. So number one, new life purchased in Christ, past tense. What baptism pictures and also what we understand about our salvation is that our salvation was actually signed, sealed, and delivered in the past tense. So let me just read Romans 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized, past tense, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. Now, if you see it there, you got past, present, and future all right in that text. But the point I'm making here is that our new life today was accomplished in the past by the finished work of Jesus. It's why baptism by immersion is such a powerful symbol, because literally we bury you in the waters of baptism just like Christ was buried. And then you come up out of the water uh, as Jesus walked away from the tomb on that third day, fully alive, so too because we were united with Christ in his death. That picture in burial is the past tense, what happened to us back then. Now take note and be careful about this. We believe that our union with Christ does not happen the moment you go under the water. I'll say it again. We don't believe that our union with Christ happens 
when we go under the water. And I say that intentionally and I say it carefully because there are some faith traditions who believe that and teach that, who believe that our spiritual regeneration, our new birth happens the moment we enter the waters of baptism. And so the implication of that, of course, would be if you have not been baptized in water, then you haven't yet been saved. You can't be saved because your salvation is attached to going into the waters that's not how we understand the New Testament teaching. We don't believe our union with Christ starts in the water. We believe that it is a picture of something that happened to us 2,000 years ago in Christ when he was buried and came back to life again. That when Jesus walked the Via Dolorosa to the cross, he took us with him positionally. Romans 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him. It happened 2,000 years ago, but in a positional way, every person who's going to come to place their faith in Christ was there with Christ in that moment. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, the old me put to death. So it means even before we had a chance to respond to the offer of salvation, even before that, God was already active accomplishing our salvation in Christ. And there is so much depth and richness to that understanding of salvation. It goes to the very heart of what we call the doctrines of grace, that God has done everything that needs to be done for us to be made right with God. There's nothing left for us to do. It was signed, sealed, finished, completed. When Jesus said it was done, he meant it was done. There's nothing, I, I, you just need to nod a little bit. Like I know it's Saturday night is late, but just give me just a little nod that I know you're, check the pulse and just make sure you're still there. There was nothing left to be added to what Jesus finished. Look at Romans 5. This is a powerful section. While we were still weak, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He was dying for the ungodly when? While we were weak. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, he died for us when? While we're still sinners. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. You're like, think that through. You're his enemy, but God is reconciling you through the work of Christ on the cross. When a person chooses to enter the waters of baptism, what they're acting out in part is a history lesson. That my life was hidden positionally in Christ when he went to the cross. He went there on my behalf. He was crucified for my sin. He was buried in my place. Everything he did, he did on behalf of someone else, not himself, but us. The second aspect is this. An equally an important promise, the amazing promise, acted out in baptism is the new life promised in Christ's future tense. Future tense, that just as Christ was raised from the tomb, so too we will be raised physically from our tomb. So if you were here a few weeks ago, Easter weekend, we talked about this on that particular weekend. It was the theme, of course, that just as Jesus walked out of the tomb alive, there is a promise that we too will walk out of the tomb alive. He is called the first fruits from the grave, and that word first fruits just simply indicates there's going to be more to follow. He was the first, there will be more to come after him. In John 5, we looked at it. An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment, but every person will be raised. And so John's gospel makes it very, very clear. And the Christian faith believes that the eternal nature of the soul is coupled with the eternal nature of our bodies. And not every religion believes this, so I'm, I'm making a point of it again. Particularly Hinduism and Buddhism believe in endless cycles of reincarnation and that ultimately the soul is simply absorbed into the consciousness of the universe. And they, they describe it like this, as like a droplet going into the great vastness of the ocean, the eternal, infinite, the so-called nirvana. And the soul is just absorbed into that nirvana and the self dissipates. And there is no eternal consciousness for the soul. John makes it very clear in his gospel that one day Jesus is going to call us out of the grave. Every person who's ever lived. 
So from Joseph Stalin to Adolf Hitler to Billy Graham and Mother Teresa and everybody in between them, and the only question that will matter in that moment is what have you done with Jesus? On whose merit are you wanting to stand in the presence of God? And so when a person chooses the waters of baptism, they're acting out in part a future reality. And then finally, finally, and maybe the most relevant uh, that impacts us on a daily basis is that baptism pictures my new life empowered by Christ in the present tense. That there is a new power given to me. That, that water baptism is a living, breathing representation of a new life present that as we wait for that great day, the future day, uh, when we talk about when sin and death and the grave have been banished, that we live lives now like trailers of the coming attraction. So you're all familiar with this. There's a great box office movie going to be coming out in six weeks. And, and so the trailers are being played in advance. And they are to tease us and to entice us to go see the full-length movie. It's the same way with our Christian life. We know the great movie is coming in that great day of the Lord. And our lives are the trailers for the eternal movie. Amen? So people should be able to look at us and get a little glimpse, and it won't be perfect, but a little glimpse of what the inbreaking kingdom of God is supposed to look like. You want to know what a redeemed life looks like? So you don't want to want to know what kingdom life looks like? Just look at the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. Look at the children of God. That's what it's going to look like. David Watson, an, an old, old book, but a goodie. I believe in the church. It is the church that is willing to die to worldly standards that will know the power of Christ's resurrection. Now listen what he has to say about it. <clears throat> it may be envied, this kind of church, for its depths of loving relationships or its spontaneous joy. People might envy us. Or it may be hated and persecuted for its revolutionary lifestyle, exposing the hollow values and destructive selfishness of the society it seeks to serve, but it certainly can't be ignored. It might be envied or it might be hated, but you can't ignore it. When God reigns among his people, they become like a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. And of course, he is echoing Jesus' own words. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, who said, you are the light of the world. Now, Jesus came saying, I'm the light of the world. First tense. I'm the light of the world, Jesus said. And then he turned to his disciples and said, and by the way, you are the light of the world as well. And you don't put a light under a bushel. You put it up on a lampstand so it can give light to the whole city. It is like a city set on the hill. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So when a person chooses to go through the waters of baptism, what they're saying in part is I am burying the old way of life. I'm putting to death my sinful past. And as I emerge out of this watery grave, I am graphically picturing the new life that I hope to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we look to those passages. 2 Corinthians 5, I already looked at it before. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new is gone has come. And the power to live out a victorious Christian life in the here and now is embedded in our union with Christ. That this new life, this new way of living is impossible without the enablement of the Spirit of God. And so like Paul cries out, we cry out too, oh, I want to know the power of the resurrection. I haven't obtained it yet, but I keep pressing on toward that goal. And what Paul is saying there is crazy good news, because what he's saying is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is actually available to us today. Let me say it again. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us today. Do you believe it? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's worth a woo. And it's this final aspect of resurrection power that our world so desperately needs to see. That God has called a people to himself and that he has put his glory on display in the world. And that all that is killing us in this crazy world can be reversed 
through the power of Christ in our lives. That the craziness of culture, that there is a countercultural movement in the midst of it. And it is not for us to stand at the outside and just pummel away at the world with accusations and critique, uh, which we do all the time, but instead to simply live out an alternate story alongside the chaos that's around it, to live a different story. This is what the city of God was all about, that ancient work of St. Augustine. Like, it's like 1,600 years old. Probably the, the, the most impactful book in church history, I would venture a guess. And if you want to just summarize that book down to this, these two, the tale of two cities, the city of God being built within the city of chaos all around it, then there is always intermingled the wheat and the tares, as Jesus said, and that God is calling Christian people out of the midst of the chaos to live Christian values and the flourishing of their lives and ultimately the flourishing of a nation as well. Basically, if you wanted to summarize city of God down to just one simple statement, Augustine would have said to us, Christians make good citizens. If the spirit of God has actually impacted you and you are walking in newness of life, you're going to be a better husband. You're going to be a better wife. You're going to be a better employee and a better employer. You're going to be a better student. You're going to be a better neighbor. You're going to be a better everything because the spirit of God has turned your life upside down and you're now living in the power of new life. Amen? And so it's like salt and light. He spreads us out in the community to live an alternate story. An entirely new way of life has been opened up through Jesus. So water baptism is a public testimony to a threefold spiritual reality. New life purchased in Christ, past tense. New life promised in Christ, future tense. And new life empowered by Christ, in the present tense. And so it means that we are people who live as free people, no longer enslaved to sin, no longer held captive to our old way of life, but free to walk in the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so in a few minutes, we're gonna, we're gonna sing these words in just a few moments. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You've broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Direct quote out of 1 Peter. And so if you're here and you're just checking out the Christian faith, you're here and you're like, I wouldn't say that I am yet a believer. I've got questions, that's why I'm here. I'm interested, I'm curious. I hope that you will see and hear and understand how great the love of God towards you is. That God looked down into our messed up world and he saw the chaos, he saw the problems of the the world at large, and he saw the problems in the individual human heart. He saw the brokenness and the pain of our sin and our rebellion, and that God said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send my son to fix that problem. My son is going to live the perfect life that none of these people could live. He will die a death in the place that they deserve to die, and then he will offer their new life. I hope you'll hear and understand that. And there's other people in this room, and I don't know who you are, but I know there are people in this room who have made a profession of faith in your heart but you've never publicly declared it in the waters of baptism. Uh, It was one of the first commandments. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so baptism, we would say, is one of the first steps of obedience. You don't wait until you're perfect. It's early on in your faith journey. You publicly declare your faith in Christ. And there are some in this room who've come to faith in Christ, but you've never declared it through the waters of baptism. I hope you'll be challenged tonight to consider Uh, Is it time for you to publicly declare your faith? And then finally, I know that there's a bunch of you in this room who made a profession of faith years ago, who were baptized years ago, and my question is, can you tell your face to be happy about it? From the moment you crawl out of bed in the morning, from the time your feet hit the floor, can you remind yourself of the goodness and the grace of God in your life? Thank God that he saved me, past tense. Thank God that I got a future hope, future tense. And thank God that today he will give me the power I need to live a spirit-filled life today. Amen. Tell your face that. Woo. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And I'll pray for us and we'll be on our way. Uh, So Lord Jesus, what an exciting weekend it is to hear the testimonies of men and women who have placed their faith and trust in you. They've heard the call of God uh, from darkness to light. 
Uh, they've responded in placing their faith in the finished work of Jesus, and we rejoice with them in that great gift. And Father, as we listen to these testimonies, we are reminded of the grace of God in every one of our lives, that there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. And so thank God that by your grace, you made a way where we could not make a way. Uh, you made it possible for us to be reconciled to you through Jesus, and then ultimately to one another through that same healing work that Jesus does in our life. And so, Father, over the course of this weekend, we pray for these that will be baptized. We pray that it would be a great encouragement as they take this public step of testimony. We pray for them, Lord, in the days to come, because we know often after a public declaration, the enemy will come in with discouragement or spiritual battles. And so, Lord, we pray a hedge of protection around them, uh, that in these coming days and weeks that you would guard them and keep them strong in their walk of faith. And so, Lord, uh, encourage us in what we're going to see and witness in these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen.